Let's go. Good afternoon and welcome back to the Hoosier Huddle podcast as we hit the middle of June here, TJ. College football is right around the corner. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the news from preseason All-American teams, all-conference teams, you know, Athlon and Lindy's, Phil Steele are all out, all your normal things to get you excited for college football. And then there's the dark storm cloud of private equity and conferences looking to get branded. Um, and we'll, we'll get into all of that during this episode. We'll, you know, talk about what we're looking forward to uh, in, in 2024, what we're dreading, and then maybe some things that are coming up on the horizon in the next, you know, between three and and 36 months here uh, for college football that it, it seems to be going super quickly uh, in, in terms of change. And, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of it, but it, it's something we got to talk about if we're, we're going to talk about the state of college football. So uh, welcome in. How, how have you been since we last talked? Yeah, doing great. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. Obviously, we prefer to just focus on, you know, what's going to happen on the field. Um, you know, the, the season is less than 100 days away. Our countdown well underway on the site. Um, that That's always kind of the marker that you can really start to look forward to. I know both of us are diving into opponents and doing opponent preview content. So you've got that side of it. And that's a whole lot of fun to talk about, uh, but you're right. We cannot ignore the things that are surrounding the sport that we love right now that uh, are going to fundamentally change that sport. Uh, it's going to fundamentally change college football. And there's no, you know, we're an IU podcast. There's no guarantee that Indiana is included in whatever the next iteration of this product is. Uh, it, it, you know, it, we don't know how it's going to play out. Indiana doesn't know how it's going to play out. But I think that they absolutely do know that there's a sense of urgency to get your football product as good as it can possibly be as quickly as you possibly can. Because you're right, this, these changes are happening very quickly and if they choose not to include you because you don't offer value where's that leave you we don't know yeah and you know specifically we'll we'll get into that in a second but a few new changes for 2024 moving to a 12 team playoff um yeah. which i good i don't bad. like it's good and bad yes um you know it makes some of these postseason games a little bit more uh, exciting. It's it's cool to have the first round playoff games on campus, right. which I, I'm a big fan of. Yep. Um, but again, it's made for TV. Uh, and, and you see all these TV people coming into conferences and in positions of power um, to ask a fan, and I'll use the Big Ten, for example, to ask a fan, let's say an Ohio State fan or a Michigan fan to go to Indianapolis the Big Ten title game to playing a second round or first round playoff game uh, or a second round neutral site playoff game and then a semifinal game and then a final game, you're right. pri you're pricing out uh, again because you've already priced out the average fan. Yep. You're making it like the NFL Super Bowl where it's the hoity-toity, the people who can afford to go, go. And it takes a lot away from from the traditions of, of college football, where it's the fan base, it's the alumni base, and yeah, I'm sure there there are plenty of loaded alumni who go to these games, but that was the difference between the NFL and college is that you felt more of a connection because you went to IU or you went to Ohio State, and you felt like that's. I'm affecting it because I have a degree or whatever from the school or I donate and, and stuff like that. So that's something to take a look at, but it does open the door for other teams a, a little bit. Uh, but again, in college football, unlike college basketball, it's usually the two, the two best teams. And there's not many times, not more than two. 
Uh, and, and you saw in the college basketball this year, UConn and Purdue were on a collision course to the final, and that's what happened. And you knew UConn was clearly the best team in the country. So, what's your take on the twenty yeah. on the twelve team playoff? Well, so I think it it changes the amount of teams that can feel that they realistically have a chance at the playoff. Obviously, you expand the number to twelve, therefore you increase that pool of teams that could make a playoff. Does it increase the number of teams that can actually win a national title? In my opinion, no. No, it does not. Uh, I, it, the, the amount of times that you are going to see a 7 through 12 seed actually be competitive for a national title, I think you can counts on maybe one or two fingers and those instances are probably because of injury where you know maybe a a team that gets an eight seed say i don't know uh an ohio state sure uh ohio state loses a couple of games in the regular season because of an injury to a key quarterback and they make the playoff at 10 and 2 they get an eight seed. They win their first round game because now their quarterback's healthy and they're hosting that game against a nine seed. And then they go and are small underdogs in the second round, win that game and advance further because they have the overall profile and talent to get that done. But by and large, those lower seeds, they can be competitive to win a round. Not more than that. I think you're yeah. going to see I, – I think that you will see a couple of very fun, very competitive first-round games, and I think that it's really cool. Like it, It's going to be awesome to see uh, just projections for this coming season, say the third-place team in the Big Ten against the – maybe like the second-place team in the ACC – the ACC team traveling to uh, Penn State for a, a on-campus playoff game, like that's going to be a whole lot of fun and probably very competitive. You get past it to where it's neutral site; those top three, four seeds on a you know any given year, that number is going to shift a little bit, but it's mostly going to be uncompetitive until again, you get to that final. Uh, we see it now with the college football playoff. Most years, one of those semifinals is awesome. And one of the better games of the year. And then one of those semifinals is usually not all that competitive. Um, I think you're going to see the same type of thing. So it, it definitely cheapens the regular season for just the impact that one loss actually has. But you also could say, well, that's true, but it increases the interest in the regular season for those teams that are like six through 20, you know, yeah. that, that they have something to work for. That's not just a trip to the Gator bowl. Um, so I think that that, is the the positive part of it, and then there's the negative part of it. So I overall, we knew that expanded playoff was coming. It is here. I'm glad that we get on campus games. And you're right. There's very, very few people that can actually follow their team in person through three or four playoff rounds after. The people that do that have probably already gone to all the home games or most of them and have probably gone to the conference title game. So we'll, I'm sure that there will be articles that price out exactly what that would cost somebody to do uh, once it gets time and you know what ticket prices are. It's going to be very very expensive. So you're looking at a very very small percentage of people that could actually do that. Most people won't be able to go at all. They'll only be able to watch on TV or they'll have to choose, hey, 
we get to host a first round playoff game. Who knows if we'll ever get to do this again. That's the one we're going to go to and that's it. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to have people that choose. And that that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, it, but no. it, it does kind of further corporatize the the overall college football product, which is the direction it's been going and that that fast forward button has been hit on that for sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and to me, it's like, stop trying to make it the NCAA tournament. There's not going to be an Oakland. And let's be honest, Oakland had no shot of winning at all. None. They got, right. you know, they had a guy go off against Kentucky and hit whatever it was, 10 three pointers <laughs> uh, or 11 three pointers. And they beat Kentucky. It was fun. It's a lot of fun to watch those upsets. But they yeah. have, you have no shot to win it all. And I don't know why, you know, maybe it's the casual fan or the people who just don't get college football. Stop trying to make it the NCAA tournament. It, it's never going to be that. You're like, let's say Liberty wins a group of five bid this year. There is no shot that they're winning the national championship. They I mean, might, did we win. just see that? We just saw it against Oregon. And that and was on a neutral clobbered. site. And they this got time, clobbered. They'll be going to Autzen Stadium. Yep. Like that's how it would play out. They'd be going to Autzen Stadium. And, and it'd be even worse. Yeah. And let's say they end up beating Oregon and then you go and play uh what Georgia on on a neutral site. Yeah, you no know, right. you're beat up. You 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 have a short window to turn around. It's just to me it's the, that the ship has sailed. There is no point in arguing it anymore. The only question is how how far are they going to expand it, and how soon are they going to expand it to sixteen or twenty four teams? Yep. We'll and see. the answer to that question is not, oh, that would be a better product. The answer to that question is, oh, this TV network will pay this amount of money for those two additional games yep. for thirteen through sixteen. Yep. Or for those, you know, that that's going to be what determines the answer to that question. Yep. And then it brings me to my second point. You're adding more games. You're asking players to play more games. Sure. Uh, revenue sharing is coming. I think it's coming in 2025. I think that's what they announced, but it's coming. So, you know, I think the Big Ten has allotted $22 million to, to be uh, across right. all sports for each school. And um, I don't know the exact, I think it was 8 million for football and stuff like that. At, at, at some point, how many games is too many games to play? And are you going to cut down the regular season? Um, are you going to cut it down from 12 games to 11 games? Are you going to make it 10 conference games? Like, what are you going to do here? And then the big question on, on that is, what do you do with the smaller divisions? What do you do with FCS? What do you do with group of five? And how do they survive? And that also brings us right back to what, what came out yesterday, that the Big 12 is seeking private equity to sponsor right. the conference. And that is a word that makes, that makes me shudder. Private equity in college football would absolutely destroy the sport. Uh, and it's not just, oh, the Big 12 is desperate. They are, but guess what? Everybody, there's never enough money for everybody. It brings me back to that scene in Ted Lasso in season three when they're trying to form the Super League. And Rebecca says, you know, don't you guys have enough money? Like, what, what are we doing here? It, it, mm -hmm. Isn't this supposed to be for the fans and the rivalries and all that stuff? And you're the, the bubble of college football um, has always been on the verge of bursting. It's closer than ever now, and it, and it's yeah. rapidly, rapidly expanding. What are your thoughts on on private equity into well, to college football? Yeah, so there's two different two different lines it could take, right? Private investment, which was a model that was leaked out, I don't know, maybe a month, two months ago, um, that when that got leaked out, that story got leaked out. It was very clear that, hey, this group doesn't want ownership of any sort, which was kind of, you scratch your head like, well, okay, sure. Yeah, I believe that. But it was 
they invest and then they get their funds back and then begin to take a percentage, but they don't have any type of ownership decision or any type of say. What was, came out with this Big 12 story was a influx of capital. I, I believe it was somewhere in the range of 800 million to 1 billion or something like that that would be spread out amongst the members of the Big 12 in exchange for 15 to 20% ownership of the product. So what happens when a private equity firm has an ownership stake with their money on the line? It's obvious. They make every decision strictly with bottom line in mind. Yeah, I compare we have this seen to it. parents paying for a wedding, TJ. You know, your mom says, oh, hey, sure. we'll sure. give you so much money. And I, I, I promise I will stay out of it. Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. an empty promise. Well, well, I want to invite these friends because, you know, I'm kind of paying for it to do me a favor. And it's eventually yeah. going to come yeah. down to that. Yeah, yeah. And we we have seen a very similar model in lots of different industries. The most – I mean, we are not journalists, but uh, we have seen it in journalism, multiple newspapers, websites, uh, magazines, private equity firms in flux cash make promises about – Oh, we're not going to change the product. We love the product. That's why we're investing in the product. We love it. Love it. And then they start laying people off. Yep. And then they start cutting costs. Yep. And then they start stripping down the product to where there's it's barely recognizable as what it originally was. And then they chirp about, well, we saved it. We saved it. You know, we saved the, you know, uh, whatever that product is, we saved it. We save that newspaper, we save that magazine, but it doesn't look anything like what you remembered from five years ago. No, it's like what happened with Sports Illustrated. It used to be a must read for Sports me. Sports Illustrated's I, I, a great example. Yeah. Every it's a great month. example. And you had Rick Riley in the back page. You had some great writers, great articles. Sure. And then all of a sudden, not like it doesn't exist. But they saved yeah. Sports Illustrated for a certain amount of time, and that's my fear with college football. And it's if you're an, an I, yeah, yeah, and if you're an IU football fan, you better hope that their model is for like seventy teams to move up into Division One instead of forty, because well, right. if let's, it's forty, let's turn, it. let's turn that. Let's turn it to Indiana centric. For the IU fan out there that says we're in the Big Ten, we're in the Big Ten, we're good, we're one of the halves. We are one of the the chosen included group, maybe. But what do you say to the people that are just 100% confident that Indiana, as a result of, oh, we've got a, we have a strong basketball fan base, okay? Or the IU fan that says, hey, we're in the Big Ten. The Big Ten is one of the two big boys. We're good. What do you say to those people? Why does this matter outside of just, the overall college football product, why does it matter to Indiana? Well, here's the thing. If private equity comes in in the Big 12, what's stopping it from going to the Big 10 and the SEC? They're clearly better investments. They're, they're making more money. They have bigger brands and all that stuff. So if they're going to come in and, you know, the, everybody wants more money, it seems like. And, and it's never enough. And if somebody's going to offer the Big 10 – I don't know what the number would have to be, but a gigantic number of more money than I can imagine. Somebody's going to say yes. And then they're going to realize that teams in the Big Ten, and I think it was the cover three podcast was starting to go through, you know, the SEC and the Big Ten. Like, do you really need two teams in the state of Mississippi? Well, Mississippi yeah. State would be gone. Do you really need Vanderbilt? And Vanderbilt and IU are kind of the same. Um, you know, in terms of success in the football field, like, why are we keeping Vanderbilt football afloat and wasting that money when we could save that money and still have, you know, the brands like Georgia, LSU, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, in the Big Ten? Do you really need, especially if Notre Dame, 
you know, they, they coax Notre Dame and the Big Ten. You have three power four schools in Indiana. You have yep. Purdue, Notre Dame, and Indiana. Which one – you're nervous about Purdue, too, if you're a Purdue fan. But, oh, yeah. You know, if they take two out of the three, Indiana's probably the one getting caught. You know, they right. – they, they, and they've done a solid job from Tom Allen to Kirk Snetty to – Try, kind of figuring that out, but it might be too little too late. So if you're an Indiana fan, you better hope the next two or three years, one, that this private equity thing slows down. And two, that Signetti could win some games and IU can make some significant upgrades to the stadium and figure out how to turn a profit, whether that's, you know, through the NIL deals or through, um, you know, naming rights in the stadium and in the field. There are a lot of things that IU fans need to be uh, concerned about. And sure, basketball, you have basketball fans, great. But none of this is mentions basketball, Not at least that I've seen. It has not been, oh, we, we got to go in in basketball with private equity. It, it's only been football. And... <laughs> you're on the chopping block, especially if that, if that number is 40 to 50, it, it, it's dicey and it's starting to get real. You know, we pushed this side because it has been on the horizon and it, it's been a hypothetical, but it, it's that, that horizon's coming up quickly. Yeah. Yep. No doubt. I think that um, the way that we're going to handle it um, on this podcast or as a site uh when you know we're not gonna if somebody wants to rumors. give me a billion dollars for the site we're gonna change yeah yeah we're not gonna talk about rumors we're not gonna post uh every news story that comes out if there is something that directly clearly impacts indiana or clearly immediately impacts college football we're gonna talk about it but i think by and large uh we as a site want to focus on college football the season and the, the on-field product uh in indiana you know as much as we can yep. um, and let's turn it let's turn we'll to, to doing, that so yeah let's let's turn this po uh, podcast a little bit more positive uh in things that we are looking forward yeah. to in 2024 yeah. we talked a little bit about the expanded playoff and games on campus um you know new big 10 uh with with Four new teams uh, with Oregon, Washington, UCLA, and USC. Indiana's got a whole new coaching staff coming in, uh, and, right. and the excitement's pretty high. What are you most excited about in 2024? Yeah, so the obvious answer for us is going to be Indiana football. The, the optimism, the positivity surrounding that. We'll dive into the specifics of Indiana's season and the, the roster, the new coaching staff, all of that. We're going to obviously deep dive all of that non IU related. I think that what I am most excited about beyond just your regular having college football back in our lives. I mean, it's a huge part of every fall for us. Uh, so beyond the obvious things, I'm really looking forward to uh, the amount of Parity is definitely not the right word, but I I do think that there are a good number of teams that have a real chance to, one, make the playoff, and two, win a game. I, I think that the transfer portal plays into that, um, and just the amount of change that you have from season to season on a lot of these rosters – we could quibble about whether or not that's a positive, but it is here. So uh, I, I think that that kind of increases your variability um, and unpredictability. And I think that's fun. Um, and then the amount of coaching change at the top, Jim Harbaugh's gone, Sharon Moore in, Nick Saban gone, Kalen DeBoer in, a, a lot of, you know, new coaches, Mike Elko, at Texas A&M. And then I, I think that there's some real excitement with young quarterbacks that have a chance to drastically impact their team's seasons. 
and their team's ceilings. Uh, one that clearly jumps out right away, Dylan Raiola at Nebraska, a fan base that is starved for success and for success for them, get back to a bowl game as a start for Nebraska. And I think Dylan Raiola offers them a lot of hope there. And then Nico Iamaleva, and I butchered that. I'll get it before the season, but Nico is what everybody calls him at Tennessee. Uh, you look at their 2022 offense with Hinton Hooker, major drop-off, almost 15 points a game when they go down to Joe Milton. Now they've got Nico, who has a higher ceiling than either of those guys, you put him into a Josh Heupel offense, what can Tennessee do? And then, for me, you look at the win total projections in the SEC and in the Big Ten, the number of teams that are right there at 9.5 to 10.5, there's going to be some really disgruntled fan bases because not everybody's going to reach that. I think that's going to be fascinating. And I think the Big 12 is going to be a ton of fun. Um, yep. Probably not any elite teams in there. It would be a surprise if somebody emerged as a 11 and 1, 12 and 0 type team. I think there's going to be a whole lot of competitive, fun games with some really consistent, fun programs like Kansas State, Utah. Uh, for me, UCF is going to be a fun one. Just a lot of teams that I think play a fun brand of football that are going to be playing really close games that matter for the Big 12 title, which gets an automatic top four spot. So a whole lot to, to look forward to on the field if we can just ignore that dark cloud and pretend like everything is all gravy. There's so much fun to be had. Yeah, it, it, parody is not the right word, but it does seem like there's fresh blood, uh, especially yeah, in the SEC. Like that, yeah. you, have, you have Kalen DeBoer taking over uh, at Alabama. Does he continue what Nick Saban has done? What, and who steps up in there? You mentioned Tennessee. Uh, you know, does Texas, Texas. Is, Texas is in there as well. Um, does Ole Miss, who's gone all in on the transfer portal, um, did they make a splash? Uh, I I think Utah's that team in the Big 12 who could go 12-0 as long as um, Cam Rising stays healthy. Right. The, you know, people look into that Northwestern Bowl loss, and but Kyle Whittingham's great coach. Utah's a really good program. Um, they could go in. It's a tough place to play, too. They could go in and, and maybe run that conference as well. And then you have in the Big Ten, does Oregon come in and, you know, knock off Ohio State or Michigan, who's, you know, represented the Big Ten and Big Ten title for a long time? Or does Penn State put it all together? Um, with Which, Tom Allen, that's that. That's another thing. Is you know, there's another story to watch at Penn State with the James Franklin um, being named in a lawsuit for falsifying medical files, and I, I've mentioned it to, to Matt Weaver and Andy Graham too. Wouldn't it be something if if it was the Penn State playoff bound Penn State Nittany Lions head by interim head coach Tom Allen? Um, right. It, it's just those are the storylines that make college football great. Not falsifying, filing medical <laughs> records or or yep. forcing people to play and, and stuff like that. But the the storyline, Tom Allen fired at IU, a little bit of a redemption story at Penn State, um, you know, stuff like that. We'll see. Group of five should be interesting, too, with Liberty. You know, James Madison should still be, you know, decent. Um but yeah, it's that dark cloud. It kind of reminds me of Caddyshack when they're playing in the rain. Hey, I, I, I keep right. playing through. The heavy stuff's not coming down for a while. Well, yeah, I'm pretty it's sure he got struck up. by lightning. Yeah. yeah. So, but at least for IU football, what am I? I'm excited about. You have a new coaching staff. Uh, it seems like you have a new philosophy in the department as well. Um, yep. Yes, and I, I want to be clear about it. Um, because I, you know, I, I, I've talked to people in the department, they did bungle the announcement of the student section. Yeah, they, sure. they did. They, you fumbled timing, it, but it the is timing. The, yeah. the, you fumbled the timing. Yeah. It is the right decision to move the yeah. students 
into that stadium. And I, I have no inside knowledge on this, but it seems like that is the first step to maybe having some major stadium renovations, you know, towards the middle of those stands. You freed up a lot of 50 yard line seats on the east side uh -huh. um, yep. and, and stuff like that. So maybe you, you get some some premium seating there and stuff like that. But I'm excited for that. I'm excited to, you know, head out to UCLA and the Rose Bowl and to see what kind of start IU goes off, you know, gets off to. Because like we said earlier in the show, the next 12 to 36 months for IU football is huge for their football and, and possi possibly is, you know, can determine where you land in the future if you come out and kirk signetti has a seven and five year and you go to a bowl game and win a bowl and you start selling tickets more and you can back that up next year with another winning season people go, okay you're we could get you real cheap right now and then increase your value and 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 things like that so mm -hmm. we'll see yeah. any final thoughts tj yeah i mean i, I think just the amount of change at indiana who knows? Like, we, we do not know how this is going to play out. What we can do is evaluate this coaching staff based on past production. This is not just, you know, us smoking hopium here. This is proven over multiple stops. This staff under Kirk Signetti, they win. That is all that they do. So we have proven production. Now, is the Big Ten different? Is Indiana a different challenge than what they've you know, uh, encountered before? Yes, it is. So how exactly does this staff transition their methods to the Big Ten? They do not seem to feel like it's going to be a problem to do so. Uh, they're not blind to the challenge that they have, but you know I, I think that they're understandably quite confident that hey, we've done it at places that were tough, and we won there too. And I think the more uh, the question that I have bigger doubts about is how does this roster, which has so many new faces, how do they mesh together? And then the second part. How do these new pieces, which so many of them coming from a lower level, how do they actually produce in the Big Ten? It yeah. is it is it's one thing to be confident about, yeah, I I can do it at this level. I played against Virginia and they're an ACC team. Or I'm confident that I can do this. I belong here. That's great. And you have to have that confidence. You have to have that chip on your shoulder. And I think a lot of these guys do belong at the Big Ten level. But once it starts flying in the middle of the season and you're going up against Michigan and you you are starting to feel those bumps and bruises accumulate on you and your depth as a roster is being tested, how does Indiana handle that? Do they fall apart? And that that's why the start of this season is so critical because that back end of the schedule gives you very little room for error. Yep. You've got to get off to that good start, get that confidence flowing. And all of those words from Kurt Signetti, all that work that they've put in in the off season, you get off to three and one, four and one, five and zero oh start. All those things become true in these guys' heads. They're no longer words. They've seen it work. Yep. And that totally changes the feeling around Indiana football. Because I, I know for me, if IU gets off to that kind of start, I will have zero doubt. Like, oh, we got it figured out. We've got it solved. Whether or not that's true long, long term, I won't care. In that moment, I'll believe. It. You know? And I think that a lot of people are feeling the same way. We're just waiting for that little bit of a sign, oh, we've got it. We've got it. And for me, that's that that start. You know, you can lose at UCLA. That's understandable and acceptable. You got to win those non-conference games and then get one of those early 50-50 games. You got to get one of them. 
Yeah, you, and if from you could there, split Northwestern, UCLA, you know, win two out of three against Maryland, UCLA, Northwestern. Yep. Um, then you Nebraska believe. is in there too. Then you start to believe. And and it's so different starting with, and no offense to FIU, but starting with FIU instead of Ohio State and yeah. Louisville in their first three games where, man, you're, you're going to get crushed or yep. starting at Iowa and then playing – Cincinnati and going to Western Kentucky and Penn State in the first five weeks of the season, um, man, it's it's confidence busting. And and you saw it in twenty twenty one where you know had IU held on against Cincinnati and beat that, who knows? Yeah. Um, you know, m- maybe the bottom falls out anyway. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but yeah, th- and don't forget this season's two bye weeks, and there's a bye week between Ohio State and Michigan. So you do have a chance to, uh, you know, recover a little bit, and you don't have to have half your team decimated by <laughs> one of the big boys, you know, the first week or month of the season. Uh, you, you could develop depth early with these non-conference games, hope, hopefully. Um, you know, and then, man, if you could go out there and beat UCLA and, you know, get that Northwestern, you're cooking with gas now. Um, yeah. And, you know, the fan base will buy in more, the players will buy in more, and, you know, we'll see. It, this team on paper is, you know, pretty pretty good. Uh, yeah. And they, they do. They have quarterback depth now. Um, you know, if, look, if you get the Tyler Cherry starting, you're, you're in trouble uh, a little bit. Um, but, you know, you have a Curtis Rourke, you have Taven Jackson, who started a couple games, who's looking to approve. And – um, you know, wide receivers are good, and you oh, yeah. got you, you brought in. Well, it's still a little thin. That defensive line got a boost with CJ West and, and some other transfers there. So we'll yep. see. There's a lot to be excited about. There's also a lot to be worried about. And one of the big questions is, you know, they need to get off to a big start. Otherwise, it, it starts creeping in, kind of like what it did with Tom Allen, and fans will get off. You know. Kirk Signetti talks a lot too about all these things and hasn't done anything on the field and fans are giving him a pass a little bit to where Tom Allen, you know, brought out L- LEO people started not to becoming a fan of it. Um, so it's, we'll see. Um, I'm not going to call anybody true fan or fake fan or whatever. Um, Cause what, if, you, if you're listening to us in June for an IU football podcast, I'm not going to question your fandom. So, no. That uh, that's going to do it for the podcast, TJ. We'll get into uh, we'll get into conference breakdowns. Yeah, more more football stuff on the field than off the field, yep. unless something crazy happens. You yeah, know, between will. now and all. Yes, I don't think it'll be as crazy as last year when we saw. No, Colorado no. leave and then Oregon and Washington join the Big Ten. <laughs> it right. just being crazy a crazy week at big 10 media days uh but we'll we'll get conference breakdowns we'll do iu breakdowns all that stuff our countdown uh hit 78 days today as of recording and uh you know we'll get into the big fellas along the offensive line keep uh coming back reading it we'll have our uh game previews as well coming out weekly starting with fiu i've watched more fiu football games than i care to admit in the last 48 <laughs> hours um so yeah. Thanks for listening. Uh, you can come back to HoosierHuddle.com. Follow us on X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, at Hoosier underscore Huddle. And also check out the College Huddle um, Podcast Network um, podcast community at uh, the CollegeHuddle.com as well. They do great stuff. They do have an FIU only podcast uh, that if you're crazy like us, uh, you can go listen to. They might be crazier than we are. Maybe. 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 All right. That does it for uh, today's show. Thanks for listening. And, uh, you know, like, rate, subscribe. Thanks.